Hypercalcemia, defined as an absolute calcium concentration in the plasma greater than 2.6 millimoles per litre, or an ionised calcium greater than 1.3 milli equivalents per litre, is an unusual event in the ICU, and severe disease is rare. However, occasional patients present with severe symptoms requiring ICU care. Calcium is an important physiological ion. It has roles in muscle excitation and function, action potential generation, neurotransmitter release, and is an important factor in the coagulation pathways. It also has numerous roles in cellular function and growth. By weight, calcium is one of the most common cations in the human body, nearly 2 kilograms in the average adult. Most calcium is, of course, bound to bones and is not readily exchangeable with the plasma. Only 0.1% of total body calcium is free in the plasma. Furthermore, only 50% of calcium is ionised and free within the plasma, the remainder bound to either albumin or other proteins or other anions. Ionised calcium is the physiologically active form and is therefore more relevant to management. Changes in protein levels, increases in biological anions, or introduction of unmeasured anions may cause changes in calcium levels. The physiological control of calcium tightly regulates the ionised form. Ionised calcium concentration is sensed by the receptors of the chief cells of the parathyroid glands, the bone, gut and kidney. In the presence of hypocalcemia, preformed parathyroid hormone is released, resulting in increased osteoclastic activity in the bone, renal resorption of calcium and synthesis of calcitriol by the kidney. The latter leads to increased calcium retention from the gut and the kidney and augments the activity of PTH on bone. Interestingly, magnesium is required for the release of parathyroid hormone. In hypomagnesemia, the parathyroids are unable to respond to hypocalcemia appropriately and will only do so when hypomagnesemia is corrected. Vitamin D is a steroid required for production of calcitriol. This two-step process requires hydroxylation in the liver and then in the kidney under the influence of parathyroid hormone. Calcitonin acts in physiological apposition to parathyroid hormone. Produced by the C-cells of the thyroid gland, it has effects on calcium wasting from the gut and the kidney and is a potent inhibitor of bone resorption. While in preclinical studies calcitonin appears to have a calcium wasting effect, this has been difficult to demonstrate in humans. Nonetheless, calcitonin has a small role in the management of hypercalcemia. Ionised calcium is measured by modern blood gas analyzers. Ionised calcium varies slightly with the serum pH due to variable binding with proteins. It is neatly demonstrated by the drop in ionised calcium that accompanies hyperventilation syndromes. Ionised calcium levels can be corrected for pH by adding 0.1 millimoles per litre for every 0.1 increase in the serum pH. Surprisingly, most laboratories measure only total serum calcium and use mathematical modelling to calculate ionised calcium. This is largely due to logistical issues with collection, as ongoing metabolism of blood post venesection can alter recorded values. These models become unreliable in critical illness where certain assumptions become invalid. It is therefore important to measure ionised calcium directly. Total serum calcium concentrations vary with protein levels. When protein levels change, in particular albumin, total concentration levels will also change, though ionised calcium usually remains in the normal range. 
This is because the ionised calcium is the variable detected in calcium hemiastasis feedback mechanisms. Total calcium levels can then be corrected for albumin by adding 0.2 millimoles per litre to the measured value for every 10 grams per litre decrease in albumin below 40. An increase in serum globulins has a similar effect on calcium. When globulin levels rise, there is a rise in total serum concentrations without an increase in the ionised calcium. In this case, corrected calcium is 0.04 millimoles per litre less than the measured value for every 10 grams per litre rise in the globulins. As ionised calcium is the biologically active form, it is essential to measure it directly. Minor increases in serum calcium often go unnoticed. Serum total concentrations higher than 2.9 millimoles per litre are often associated with symptoms and are severe when greater than 3.5 millimoles per litre. Polyuria, caused by altered tubular concentrating ability, results in dehydration and polydipsia. As dehydration and hypercalcemia worsen, confusion and eventually obtundation result. Arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy and resistance to catecholamines may occur and generalised weakness ensues. Finally, end organ damage begins with pancreatitis, gastric ulceration, renal failure and coma. A shortening of the QTC is associated with the development of ventricular ectopics and potentially fatal arrhythmias. Their presence is an indicator of severe disease requiring urgent management. A long list of causes of hypercalcemia exist. Over 90% of cases relate to either primary hyperparathyroidism or to malignancy. The more common ones are noted here. Malignancy can cause hypercalcemia via a range of mechanisms. Parathyroid hormone-like peptide is sometimes released from bronchogenic carcinoma and other cancers and acts like endogenous PTH. Alternatively, multiple myeloma and bony metastases can cause local bone destruction with consequent hypercalcemia. Lung, breast, renal and head and neck tumours are the most common solid organ malignancies involved and lymphoma and myeloma may cause local disease. Despite causing widespread metastases, small cell lung cancers and prostate carcinoma rarely cause hypercalcemia. Secondary hypercalcemia occurs when the cause of hypocalcemia, such as rhabdomyolysis or acute pancreatitis, resolve. During the period of hypocalcemia, PTH secretion is increased and may persist transiently after the underlying cause has resolved due to parathyroid hyperplasia. While immobilisation usually causes a relatively mild increase in serum calcium, this can occasionally be profound, particularly in patients with rapid bone turnover. Pseudohypercalcemia is sometimes seen in patients with essential thrombocytopenia due to the release of calcium from platelets. Collection error may also contribute to spurious results. A number of diagnostic tests should be considered to determine the underlying cause. These tests should be considered and individualised for each patient, depending on the clinical circumstances. Primary hyperparathyroidism is associated with increased levels of PTH. PTH has a phosphate wasting effect at the kidney level, and phosphate levels are usually low, and never high. A mild metabolic acidosis is also present in many cases due to an increase in bicarbonate loss. Alkaline phosphatase is usually increased due to bone resorption. 
The principles of management of severe hypercalcemia include increased urinary calcium excretion, reduced bone metabolism and release of calcium, control of the underlying condition, and symptom and complication control. Saline-induced diuresis remains the mainstay of treatment, with or without loop diuretics. Calcium-containing fluids such as Hartmann's solution should be avoided, as should thiazide diuretics, which can result in calcium retention. A urine output of 150 to 200 mL per hour is a common endpoint. Careful clinical management of fluid balance is essential and serum electrolytes should be closely monitored as other electrolytes may also be washed out. Aggressive saline-induced diuresis would be expected to reduce the total serum calcium by up to 0.5 millimoles per litre. In cases complicated by renal failure, urgent renal replacement therapy is indicated. Dialysate and replacement fluids should be calcium-free and citrate-based therapies may be particularly useful. Calcitonin has a role to play in the acute management of severe hypercalcemia. It is rapidly effective with onset inside two hours and maximal effects at 24 hours. It is also relatively well tolerated. It acts by inhibiting osteoclastic activity and has some effect on calcium handling in the kidney. Calcitriol's efficacy diminishes with time in the range of a week, likely due to downregulation of its receptors. An initial dose of 3 to 4 units per kilo is given, followed by a subcutaneous dose of 4 units per kilo twice daily. Bisphosphonates are a class of agents that inhibit osteoclastic activity and may promote osteoblast function. These are commonly used in the management of malignancy-related hypercalcemia and other causes of bone resorption. The clinical effect is relatively slow in onset and is short-lived. Patients must be rehydrated well before implementation. As a class, they are well tolerated, usually with mild gastrointestinal side effects. Pamidronate, a commonly used agent, is given in the dose of 30 to 90 mg IV. It is important to monitor phosphate and magnesium levels as these can also drop dramatically. Steroids have a role in the management of hypercalcemia due to vitamin D toxicity, myeloma, lymphoma and granulomatous diseases. Doses of hydrocortisone used in this context vary between 200 and 400 mg per day. Gallium nitrate is a second-line therapy for malignancy-related disease. The major complication is renal toxicity and should only be used once fluid resuscitation has occurred. It is a specialised drug and expert opinion on dosing should be sought. If you enjoyed this presentation, why not visit our websites at www.crit-iq.com and www.crit-nurse.com. Critique is a leading provider of online educational resources for critical care clinicians. No matter what your level of experience or training, Critique has something for you. Our regularly updated journal club and podcast interviews will help to keep you up to date with the latest news, while our echo database and modules teach you new skills. We even have a series of new apps to help you on the go. You can even join our open access blog and have your say on current topics. Critique. Critical for life.